The Right Streaky Sanchez podcast is presented by DraftKings Sportsbook. Sign up for DraftKings Sportsbook, download the app, use promo code RTS, and brought to you by By Nature Pet Foods, slow cooked with super fusion. Get 20% off your first order at Chewy by using the promo code RTRS20. Touchstone Home Products and Electric Fireplaces get 15% off with promo code TTP at zerodeadbirds.com. And L.L. Pavorsky Jewelers, where rights to Ricky Sanchez listeners go and get engaged. No promo code because the discount is just getting to see Lee in person. <laughs> On the show today, boy, we have come a long, long way. I believe the first guest we ever had on the Ricky may have been Eric Snow. Is that possible? So uh, we've gone I th- from... I, thought it was Sam. I honestly thought it was Sam. Was it? Was it Hanky? That's my memory. Well, this me. that's possible. It's very possible. Well, uh, today on the pod, we have a person who actually received thousands and thousands of votes to be president of the United States of America. Um, Knicks fan, um, a self-hating Knicks fan, um, a uh, a guy who actually, you know, when you, when a non-basketball person says that they like basketball, you're always sort of nervous. But Andrew Yang obviously likes basketball and would have yeah. preferred to talk basketball the entire time. So yeah. um, we had Andrew Yang on who makes promises about Sam Hinkie. Um, we actually get to tell him about Burner Gate. Uh, and then we talk about serious stuff like fixing uh, politicians, automation, the data dividend project. Uh, it's a real, he was awesome. So um, Andrew Yang will be on the podcast. You can find out more from Andrew on Twitter at Andrew Yang. Uh, His foundation is Humanity Forward, and then his podcast is Yang Speaks. Um, And then also, we'll talk about the Ricky offseason, which kind of seems normal. Ben Simmons shooting fucking threes in in practice videos. Uh, Joel Embiid looks in shape. It's pretty incredible. And also, we have a a funny response from some actual Swedish Ricky listeners who do exist. Um, and send us some notes on things that we got wrong when we talked about Tove Stierke. Uh, before we get started, uh, a bunch of things. First of all, there will be a playoff Ricky shirt. It's tie-dye. It is going to be available this coming week. Sign up for the newsletter. Um, you'll be able to get 10% off at writesrickysanchez.com slash newsletter. It's a, an awesome shirt. And then all of our old merch, the stuff that won't be ever on sale again, is all going to be on sale, like serious discounts, like 5 and 10 bucks off. Uh, the DraftKings hostage pool, um, free to play, all over-unders for Sixers in Orlando. And you might want to take the over on the Ben Simmons threes. That's all I'm saying. We've talked about this a bunch. Uh, go to our website. It is free to play, $500 a prize. And finally, I'll be hosting a, uh, a chat with Chuck Klosterman about his book, um, uh, uh, Raised in Captivity. Um, thanks to the Midtown Scholar Bookstore in Harrisburg. The, the chat will be on Zoom, and it is free. Um, you can go to this post on rightsrickysanchez.com for the link. And if you buy Raising Captivity from the Midtown Scholar Bookstore, support a local uh, bookstore, which is awesome, independent bookstore, and use the code RTRS at checkout. You get free media mail shipping, and they'll throw in an extra book for free. Um, and finally... A, a process pup from way back in the day, Sammy, who became a process pup in 2018, uh, passed away yesterday. One of the great things about doing all the dog stuff is we get to see all these dogs. And then one of the touching, like, hard things for me is when the dogs uh, move on and pass away, uh, we get lovely notes from the family. So we wish Sammy's family the very best. Uh, rest in peace, process pup Sammy, from back when, from the embroidery days on the, uh, the Big Barkers. So... Uh, without any further ado, Amos and the chef. Larry, sweetie, the man is here. Say the name. I say the name. I say the name. We will write y'all.
Welcome to the Rice Ricky Sanchez podcast. I'm Spike Eskin, along with a guy who is considering a presidential run in 2024, all done without a haircut from his apartment. That is Mike Levin. Uh, no. Yes on the haircut. No on the rest. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, hair's not looking great. I love that. it. I love letting it. it go. Let it keep going. Out of control. It's yeah. untenable. It's doing what it wants. Yeah, I was. I want to see what the next stage is, though. I'm actually yeah. excited for it. Just more down. Just keeps <laughs> this growing down. Um, uh, also, before we get started, um, I would like to thank. If you're not from Philadelphia, I was trying to explain to my friend Alex, who runs KYW News Radio, who just moved here like a year and a half ago, two years ago. Best of Philly in Philly Mag. Like, it's been going on a very long time. Now, there's no, like, ceremony or whatever now because we don't get to have those anymore. But Best of Philly is, like, a long-time thing. Um, and Wrights Ricky Sanchez was in the uh, Best of Philly edition of uh, this year in Philly Mag, which is, I don't know, funny. I mean, like, um, funny that we got the honor. I'm appreciative that we got the honor to be one of the 119 things best in Philadelphia, especially considering the timing. So thank you. Any thoughts on that? I mean, <laughs> they're wrong. <laughs> I don't know what we're doing here. Haven't known it for a while. <laughs> yep. But we're doing it. Yeah, we sure are. Um, why don't we say our talk about um, the Ben Simmons videos is brought to you by Kinetic Skateboarding. Love Kinetic Skateboarding. Doing great. Made it through the pandemic. Uh, they have the store open. You're only allowed in one at a time and you have to wear a mask. So they're doing it very safely. Uh, but kineticskateboarding.com, you can just order everything online. It's awesome stuff. Uh, go to kineticskateboarding.com. Use promo code Dave Silver for 9.1% off your first order. Okay. Ben Simmons shooting threes in the gym. I will ask you again. I've asked you, I think, over each last podcast. You know, you've taken the under in the DraftKings pool, the two and a half threes. You still are not buying it. I am actually fully buying it. I believe he's going to shoot between one and two threes a game. Have you? Are you? Are you there yet? Or you still believe it when I when I see it in real games? I just I just can't get hurt again. <laughs> I can't do it. Um, it's look, love seeing it. Love seeing him just like willingly taking them both mm -hmm. in practice mm -hmm. or in like scrimmage mm -hmm. and in just like you know, assistant coach passing him the ball and he just keeps taking him. I also like him continuing to take them when miss. Like, miss. I don't care. Mm -hmm. Let's see what it looks like. Um, it's nice to see, but I will not believe it until it's a regular thing. That being said, I do think that I, I have over the last, like, week and a half, I think, my broken brain has gotten to a place where I do believe the Sixers will win the championship. Oh really? Well, that hasn't, yeah. that hasn't taken very long. I mean, I, I think it's been I've been out for I mean now like seven months or something. It's been a long road of being out on this team, but uh, I think the the like shake combined with like a, a willingness of everyone to just like come to the table and you know like commit to this thing uh, to buy it, using everybody together. Yeah. Um, Embiid looked. Pretty svelte and uh, motivated in those in those videos. Uh, no backup center named Greg Monroe. I. They're just very big and defensive minded when they want to be, and I think that if they're if they want to be in Orlando, which it seems like they do, I think they're going to win. And as far as like <laughs> what would happen, you know. That would have to, the the things that would have to happen for the Sixers to win a championship, like a a full scale pandemic with hundreds of thousands of lives lost, feels like the right circumstances for these fucked up people to win a championship and torture us with that. That's the only thing that I'll agree with is the very last point is that this is the the only way that we can have a championship is if we don't get to celebrate the, the proper way. Like the only way that the Sixers get to win the championship is if there is a cascade of doubt on the entire thing. That's right. And, and that there cannot be a, a parade. And that like, and, and the parade is held online where this was born. Right. I guess that's I guess having a Zoom parade is the only real way to do it. Um. Yeah, I mean, like, look, like he's they're going to give him a chance to do it. And I would posit 
that him having uh, playing with another, rather than saying he's playing a four, playing with another guard on the floor and sort of playing that position is going to give him more opportunities as the ball swings to him, which it, it didn't really, it had less of a chance to do playing the, the way that they played before. Um, and it, he'll, he will be open. He'll have the chance to do it. So here we are again, fucking talking about it again. Um, That's it. What if you had a bet on one being more likely, Ben Simmons shooting one to two threes per game, or Joel Embiid looking in? Wow, that guy really worked out all off season form. Uh, Embiid, Embiid by a lot. Really, Embiid by a lot. I think there's a chance that Simmons takes a couple over the course of the whatever twenty ish games that they'll be there, be there for. Um, but one to two threes per game, going from one to two threes a season to one to th- two threes per game. It's, I'll, I just will have to, like, I will have to believe it when I see it. I can't bring myself to see that again. So I'm just assuming it's going to be Ben Swiss Army knifing around the court, you know, setting screens, cutting to the basket, being a lob threat, going after offensive rebounds, um, just being, you know, getting the ball at the elbow and driving, like, one dribble from there. Like, it's going to be exciting. It's going to be exciting to see him, like, unlocked in that way. But I, I just, I... I I have to guard my heart a little bit from the idea that he will disappoint in the sh- shooting department once again. I just need to I need I need I need some some little wall between me and that. One of my favorite things is the um any you know, we have a lot of listeners we found that are not very online. Yeah, you know, like there's way more people that listen than there are in the world of the Twitter that we see. Uh, so, so if you're not a Twitter person, um, I'm going to try to explain this as best as I can see, as best as I can say the, it is amazing to me to watch the subset of, uh, of our group that is just like, Ben doesn't need to shoot. Anyone who needs to, thinks he needs to shoot is a fucking idiot. Watch the games. This guy's dominant. Totally. He never needs to shoot. Anyone who ever said he did is a fucking moron. And the minute there's a, a video of him shooting threes in the gym, they're like, Told you so. This is the fucking NBA. Put him on notice. This is over. Like, like the same people to go from it never needs to happen to this happening literally ends the NBA is is one of my favorite things to see, honestly. Yeah. I mean, and mostly it's Dietrich on the one side. He, and he doesn't – I don't think he gets swayed by the – No, no, no. But it's the people the It's the people who don't know that Dietrich is being a giant troll and have just bought into it. I don't think season. he. I don't think he's being a troll. He is being a troll. He is. I don't think so. He's he is a hundred percent being a troll. He's that's his entire existence is being a troll. I support it. Like I I I it's fine. He like I don't even think he watches the Sixers to be honest with you. Wow. He's an actual Knicks fan. I'm like a joke Knicks fan, but he's an actual Knicks fan. Wow. Fucking go talk about some club in New York or whatever the fuck you do on that podcast. Stop talking about the Sixers. Definitely a troll. Uh, but again, I respect it. And he got Brian Colangelo out of our lives. So I will be forever in his, in his debt. Um, some other things from Orlando team apparently went golfing together, um, which is the closest thing I believe that we've seen to a, a team trip to Napa golf, yeah, uh, golf in Florida. This is right. Uh, listener Emma reached out to say um, to say that this was the golfing and the fishing. Oh, really? Uh, is is the Napa one weekend on steroids? And I I hadn't thought about it that way. Or at least I don't remember thinking about it that way. Um, and I think that that's right. I think that this is exactly what we've been asking for 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 many years. Yeah. The Sixers. I don't want to say bad chemistry, but lukewarm chemistry. Um, We're looking for any chemistry at all. They're just abs- They're the absence of of chemistry. This not season, not bad chemistry, but the absence of it. Right. Yes. This season. So I I've been looking for just like take a nice trip. NBA players love wine. Mm-hmm. Go to Napa, experience a few things, talk about life and love, and come out of it. Maybe you get into a fight. Now I'm just thinking about the movie Sideways. Maybe you get into a fight over like a spit bucket, and you like someone gets punched in the nose, but like it's good. Um, I forgot about that movie. And then they come out on the other side, and they're like, "We're, we're good now. We're a basketball <laughs> team, and we're gonna fight for each other." Um, but this is that, you know. 
this is that. They're 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 golfing, fishing. Kylo Quinn's breaking a boat. I'm really enjoying Matisse's uh, video series. Well, they're, they're um, being forced to to be in the same place. Like they're it's lovely. It's, it's delightful, but but also getting to hang out themselves. It's not yeah. like there's it's it is a combination of of kind of being you know held hostage as we've said um while having the freedom and time to be like well what do you want to do there's a lot of time between yeah. all this stuff it's like summer so, camp it's it's really like summer camp it's like yeah. rich guy summer camp you know uh, hostage Sounds nice. so i'm i i'm fully in on hostage disney is nap one week on steroids thank you emma i'm in who do you believe and thank you emma i, I did not see that but um thank you emma who do you believe is the best sixers golfer do you have a take on that Mm. I would have guessed like James Ennis with like a he's, wacky weird swing he's not on the Sixers though I know <laughs> I'm aware of that um, he did he did have coronavirus though he, he did he said he's recovering he did. yeah uh, a lot of weird a lot of weird former Sixers stuff in the news with Rashawn oh yeah well I had Rashawn on the list yeah um, I don't know I, I don't I can't I can't really identify a good a good golfer. I don't know that I would well, with like traits that that would have to so they'd have to have. So my thought is it has to be a veteran. Um, I think it's more likely somebody who is more compact and less big. Um, Maybe like an Alec Burks. Yeah. Um, Neto. Um, I don't I don't know that like. There's much. I think golfing feels like it's such an American American thing. thing. That's a good point. Um, what other vets? Are... I, I can't imagine Kylo Quinn doing it. No, doesn't, doesn't seem like the guy that. And he's not compact. He's not. He's a. He's a, like a big tall guy. Like it's harder if you're. The, if you're taller, like the amount of things that can go wrong mechanically with your swing are more, and they're more. They're more drastic uh, if if something's wrong a little bit. So, it would. Uh, you know, man, this is where we need Iggy. If we're talking about former uh, Sixers, there's no chance that Iggy wouldn't be the best golfer. Um, hmm. I, I guess I wrote down the question. I didn't even really think about the answer. Uh, I'm going to go with Horford just because he's the most vet on the team and the most likely to want to get away from everyone else. Uh, Speaking of Horford, uh, Alyssa and Taylor of Table Flipping Podcast went on Anna Horford's podcast. Wow. And they're like texting. They're like friends. Mm. Alyssa and Anna Horford are friends now. Wow. And it's... And it's Lakers fan uh, and a Celtics fan, so they can easy. Yeah. Wow, wow, Just it's like true. It's true. Um, Alyssa's put more time into the Sixers than any right right minded person ever has. I would uh, agree. That's fair. Still Lakers fan, um, sure. yeah. but yeah, I I no, look invited on the pod. I'm pro Alyssa. I'm just I think kidding. Alyssa's taking some of that Lakers swagger and confidence into now thinking that her friendship with Anna Horford will allow Al Horford to be good now. Uh, she's well, gonna take credit for that. Yeah, I don't think that's which is a, which is inherently Sixers thing as well yeah, to take yeah. credit for something. Uh, Brett Brown said, and I believe he said this months ago during his first Zoom before anything ever got back, was that he wants to play Joel Embiid thirty-eight minutes a game in the playoffs. Sure, this is impossible. Like I, I, I just have to say, there is no way Joel Embiid will hold up playing 38 minutes a game in the playoffs. Like, I just, maybe he's just saying it. Maybe he's trying to challenge Embiid or whatever. He can't play 38 minutes a game. He can't. He, he just, I, there's just, he, he's not, either he's not going to play 38 minutes a game or he's going to get hurt. I, I just like, I'm sorry. I just, I can't do it. I can't do the 38 minutes a game thing. I'm sorry. I just can't. Sure, I mean, I hopefully the, you know, hopefully they're they're winning one game enough where he could like sit for the end of the fourth quarter, so that goes down to like thirty three, thirty four sometimes. And then when they need him to like, hey, this game we need you for forty or something, which mm -hmm. is what they did in the in the game seven of Toronto. Um, let's take a, a quick break and talk about our sponsor, By Nature Pet Foods. Um, look, Mike, I have some great news from By Nature, which is uh, slow cooked with super fusion by nature, Mike from by nature, CEO of by nature sends me an email the other day. And he was like, love what you guys did with touchstone and the, uh, Mike script. And he goes, we want to do something. We want to match the funds in pet food and we're going to donate 5,900 pounds 
of By Nature Pet Food to the Brandywine Valley SPCA. Bra uh, the Brandywine Valley SPCA, a lot of shelters do this, do these, um, these events where people who can't afford pet food uh, will come out and they'll hand out pet food for them so they can feed their pets. And they're doing more of them now. And By Nature donated 5,900 pounds of food. So, wow. yeah, to Brandywine Valley SPCA. So thank you. Amazing. Yeah, it's really fucking cool. I mean, I didn't ask him to do it or anything. He just he sent me an email. And they, by the way, before they came on uh, to any of this, and, and when we were talking, when I was talking with Mike, um, they had, they went and donated thousands of pounds of food to Brandywine Valley. I connected them earlier. So even before they were a Ricky sponsor, they came and they offered when we were talking, doing it during the entire COVID-19 thing, they were donating. So thank you to By Nature. Um, we've already had some people take advantage of the uh, Good Boy Club and Good Girl Club. Uh, Teddy, a, a bunch of cats. Teddy, a cat, uh, a By Nature pet now. Um, Mookie, a dog. And then Amos's manager, uh, Perry, who's a total fucking uh, shit bag. Um, uh, He's a Heat fan, uh, but his dog also now, um, uh, Matt Madison, I think is his dog, uh, is a by nature pet. Look, uh, here's the thing is that we, with, with Big Barker, we told you about quality. With by nature, we're going to tell you about quality. Uh, your dog processes food in, in a really short time. A human has like four hours that it takes to go through your system and for you to get nutrients out of the food. A, a dog or a cat has like around 45 minutes. So because of this, the, the food has to be more nutrient dense or they're gonna get less nutrients out of it. So by nature, slow cooks the food. And what this does is, is it keeps more of the nutrients in the food and allows your pet to get more of the nutrients from it. It supports like immune system support and skin and coat and heart and brain and hip and joint health, all validated by studies at Kansas State. This is all real shit. And by nature, and you know we're big on joints as a podcast. We're very big on joints. We want we want healthy joints. Um, and and in their entire forty years, the company that owns By Nature has not had one recall in all of their. Um, the, it's a, like a family owned business, a very small like like small business, no recalls. And if you you've ever purchased pet food or, or been around pet food, that's a long time to not have any recall. They they are using premium products in it. For your pet, super ingredients, apple cider vinegar, spinach, blueberries, ginger, coconut oil, all which are probiotics, great ingredients for your dog. Um, they, make, they make the food so it is suitable for a lot of times you'll see this is for small, this is for indoor cat, this is for outdoor cat. Their stuff is suitable for all dogs and all cats of all ages and all sizes. Um, and you'll look, the first ingredient, and this is always super important, the first ingredient on By Nature Pet Foods is always the protein. It's always the salmon. It's always the chicken. It's always that. So um, we're very, very happy to have By Nature Pet Foods. So if you get By Nature Pet Foods and your your dog or cat is now a good boy, good girl, send me a picture. Send us it. Send it to us at uh, writesrickysanchez at gmail dot com, or you can tweet it to me. Um, send it to me on on the email is better, and I'll post it on my Twitter, or Instagram. Put them in the Good Boy Club, Good Girl Club, and we're going to give you a discount if you go to Chewy and get By Nature Pet Foods, or just go to bynaturepetfoods.com, and it'll link you to Chewy. Use the promo code RTRS20. You'll get 20% off your first purchase of By Nature at Chewy. So thank you. We're very happy to have By Nature Pet Foods as a sponsor. Um, yeah. Very, very happy. And thank you again for the donation to Brandywine Valley mm -hmm. SPCA. Um, you mentioned uh, Rashawn Holmes. So Rashawn Holmes, officially the first NBA player uh, penalized for breaking quarantine, briefly crosses the line for food delivery um the fact that he had to pick it up himself so interesting well I, my guess is so i'm gonna give him the benefit of the doubt i'm gonna say that he just didn't know all the rules and like, sure. didn't listen and a lot of rules it's, it's a lot of rules it's a huge booklet um uh like they probably can order food, but somebody else probably has to get it. Like there's probably a pickup spot or something like that. Is there a food delivery that you would risk that you would risk that for? Is there like a, a one particular restaurant somewhere? That Knowingly? You, yeah. No. There isn't. Not at all. Yeah. Um, the uh, it's a huge risk doing this shit, and it, it does appear as if the the NBA is pretty serious about it. Once games start, the um, you can get penalized, like your salary and all that kind of stuff. Uh, Dwight Howard, somebody called the tattle line on Dwight Howard for not wearing a mask. 
Mm -hmm. which seems right right in Dwight Howard's sort of um, fucking, you know, what Dwight Howard seems to be famous for. And Mm -hmm. I got to say, he didn't break any of the rules. And I I caught this at the end. But James Harden accidentally wearing the thin blue line mask. Yeah. I believe him. I like I 100% believe him that he just look, thought it looked cool. Um, right. <laughs> Do you have thoughts on the the fact that all of, like the uh, delivery options in the bubble are all restaurants owned by Rockets owner Tillman Fertitta? Uh, not really. I mean, like I I would think that they would partner with a. I mean, this is like it's a very strange thing because the NBA is put in a position, um, rightly or wrongly of like trying to operate a business in and in right now. And like, I don't like them finding an owner that happens to have a bunch of restaurants in that area um, to like, like, here's the one thing to remember that is all I will say that Tillman Fertitta owns those businesses, but people work at those businesses and the people that work at those businesses are not rich. They're lying. Yeah, people work in other other businesses also. Well, no, I understand that, but but like I, like it is not crazy to me to find an owner that happens to have a bunch of restaurants, which by the way are high end restaurants that players would happen to like. Should they have gone and find like more? Sure, but like there are I don't know. There, there are just like a lot of fucking things to um, to nail down during this. As as somebody who has managed a business before. If somebody can solve your problem easily and cleanly, sometimes you just go with it. And my guess would be that somebody solved the problem of, hey, these players are going to want more than what we're giving them. They're going to want high-end restaurants. Fertitta owns a bunch of high-end restaurants. Like, he'll take care of it. Sounds like a Dave Silver apologist if I ever heard him. (laughs) I don't know. Like, I know fucking uh, one of them is Del Frisco's. Uh, Like, Joel Embiid is at Del Frisco's fucking all the time like the, the players like that shit i don't know do you do you have a, a i would love it's for that it's one owner i'm sure other owners own restaurants also and Fertitta's like a massive piece of shit he so. is a massive piece of shit i will i will agree with that um i don't know if other uh owners own restaurants they probably do i guess i i don't i my guess is here's what i would say is that my i would guess that it was somebody trying to solve a problem and got it done and then in retrospect, a lot of times when that happens, you go, okay, I could have made a smarter decision about that. Sure. Um, but, you know, I, I also think that there is a possibility that, like, you could say if, if an NBA owner owns the team, you could say, hey, look, no fucking around. Here's what we need done. Um, you can have, like, maybe the, the safety provisions you can have on are better. I don't fucking know. It is, I, I guess I am a Dave Silver apologist. I would imagine he's just trying to get shit done. That would be my guess. Just keep licking those snakeskin boots. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I didn't have anything else. If you want to do Carl Landry real quick, or if you don't. Uh, this wasn't my first album I did not like. Oh, you didn't? Didn't like it. Okay, all right. So we'll do it then. Well, before we get to Carl Landry Music Club, we should say uh, Carl Landry Record Club that I wanted to read an email from Simon. So our last Carl Landry Record Club was from our uh, a very great listener, Erin, and she sent Tove Stierke's Sway. And um, you questioned whether we had any Swedish listeners or not. Well, we do. Um, I got tweets saying that I pronounced her name. We fucking ruined her name. And then we got this long email from Simon, which is fucking great. First off, it's called Idol, not Swedish Idol. Long-time listener from Sweden that lives in Stockholm, Sweden. You've ignored my previous five emails, so I don't have any hope you'll read this either. By the way, I went through. um, All of his emails were fucking angry to us, and they were very short. Sometimes they were just subject line only. Yeah. Sweden Sweden is the Philadelphia of the Netherlands. Yeah. But due to the brain farting in the last episode of why Swedes make, quote, good pop music, parentheses, there is no such thing, I thought I'd give you some sort of answer. ABBA, Eurovision, and mandatory music in school through high school. ABBA are the jewel in Swedish music. They are our Beatles. All Swedes are forced to learn everything about them and visit their museum. The Eurovision we have for 10 weeks every year is a music competition called Melada Festivalen, 
where a total of 30 artists compete and the Swedish population vote on who should represent Sweden in the big Eurovision, Eurovision Song Contest. The, the, the Malata Festivalen is the first, a full playoffs bracket with second chances and all kind of weird shit during these three months. Um, Look, I love ABBA. <laughs> three, no, I do. I, Mamma Mia 2 is my favorite movie. Uh, it's my favorite film. Three million of the nine million that live here in Sweden watch this crap. Pop is really loved by Swedes. And lastly, the music education in school is really good. I had music class every week from the ages of 10 to 12 up through high school for one to two hours. And you can choose to study even more if you want. We also sang in school all the time as young kids uh, were forced to put on shows for Christmas and summer breaks. I should add that talent breeds talent. We have a lot of big pop artists. So if they can make it out of a dark cold Sweden through music, I can. Feel free to not read this one on the pod. I just like, thought you'd like to hear from a blonde, blue-eyed Swede who hates pop. Well, guess what? We read it. We read it. All of it. Fuck and you, Simon. And I Scandinavian. And I said <laughs> Netherlands. It's the morning. Um, so Carl Andre Record Club uh, is Polish clubs all right already. Suggested by Ricky listener Matthew Scott. Came out in 2017. They're from Sydney, Australia. Uh, most of our album, everyone knows I have like, I did, by the way, when I picked this one, I did not know it was Australian. Everyone knows I have sort of an Australian, uh, uh, heritage, uh, fetish, but, um, two guys in the band, which is kind of cool. Uh, two people rock band. There's of course is the white stripes, but if you've ever seen local H live, it's awesome. Local H is two people, a drummer and a singer slash guitar player. Um, and it is fucking wild to see how good they are alive. Um, they've only got two albums. Um, most of the songs on the album are two and a half, three minutes. I like this album better than the other album. Pretty straight ahead rock music with the vocals. I have some soul in them, I think. I, I had a hard time comparing it to anything. You didn't like it at all, though, huh? No. Mm. No. Uh, I liked it a lot. So I didn't like their other album, um, which seemed to be a little more dancey and electronic. Uh, this album is straight ahead rock. Maybe the vocals are, uh, who sings um, uh, Sex on Fire? Who sings that song? Um, you know that song is big. Yeah. Uh, I forget. Uh, it was, uh, hold on, Kings of, name. Kings of Leon. That's right. I thought the vocals had a Kings of Leon vibe, but the music was sort of like the Bronx, if you've ever heard the Bronx. I liked them. You didn't like them. Mike gives it a no. Wow, the first no. That's a no from Mike. Unbelievable. A thumbs up from Spike. Why don't we pick... I hadn't thought about it again. Why don't we pick... Um, I'm trying to pick... Why don't we pick Brittany Howard's album, Jamie? Do you know it? I don't know it. I want it to be something new. So I don't know. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. Uh, so Brittany Howard's album, Jamie, this comes from our uh, list, Ricky listener, Alexandra. Uh, that will be the new Carl Landry record club. Um, so uh, right now will be our interview with uh, Andrew Yang. Do you have any thoughts on Andrew Yang before we? Uh, he's, he's very cool and a legitimate basketball fan. We, we recorded this interview a couple days ago. So it was uh, before John Lewis died. Right. I just wanted to say rest in peace, John Lewis, and RP to the people in the civil rights movement who didn't get to live until 80 because white supremacists killed them. And I, actually, uh, we recorded on Thursday. More, Mike asked a question at the end of the podcast, um, and you didn't specify when you asked, but you asked a question about what happened in Portland with the federal yeah. agents. And I, I want to be clear that like Andrew answered this before more of the information had come out. It was sort of more in a... It, the information at the time was very vague and it's a little mm -hmm. less vague now as to who is doing that. So I just want to make sure that anyone who is listening uh, knows that. And I guess one more thing I would say, if, if you don't mind about having Andrew on the pod, just in general, um, like uh, we mentioned when we were talking about, um, I think maybe when we had Hassan on about, we were talking about like empathy in general and, um, like, I think uh, our people in general have a general lack of empathy for each other and in, in our country and in most of the world nowadays. But the important thing to remember, I was thinking when I was running this morning about something that I, I heard Deepak Chopra say about, like, the nature of reality. I'm sorry I'm, I'm doing this on the podcast, but I have no other outlet to do it. So um, uh, the thing about empathy is that 
most people will think when they think when they agree with the fact that people aren't empathetic, they will agree that those people can't see it like I do. But agreeing about the lack of empathy only works if you also agree that you can't see it. You are not looking at it like they do. It works like both ways. And I was thinking about something that Deepak Chopra said about like the nature of reality. He started talking about a table and he said, like, I'll, I'll try to like put it in my own words. Imagine like a $200 coffee table in your living room that was there when you were growing up. When you're a child, you see that coffee table one way. And when you're an adult, you see the exact same coffee table a completely different way. It looks something different. It's much smaller. It's older. It's all of those things. To a rich person, that coffee table is a piece of shit. To a middle class person, that coffee table may have been the, like the nicest thing that ever existed. And what Deepak Chopra said was that what the mistake that we make is we think that there is one specific truth as to what that coffee table is. But the problem is, is that like there isn't one like like it's hard to know what that truth is. And we all totally believe that our truth is the right truth um, and not realize that to a rich person that might actually be a piece of shit, that coffee table. And to uh, you, that might be a great coffee table. And to a child, you better watch out when you're running through the house because that coffee table might hit you in the head. And to an adult, that coffee table, there's no threat at all. So I would guess I would just say that like, the way that we view reality is very specific to all of us. And if we don't start looking at reality about how other people see it, and like this came from the, you know, um, from the, the movement, from the Black Lives Matter movement about police and how they, uh, and how a black person must look at police as opposed to how a white person looks at police is very, very different. One person looks at it as like, oh my God, thank God you're here. And another person, person could look at it like, oh no, what's going to happen to me because you're here? is just remember that it is like, it's all of us is I guess what I would say. Um, and none of us really know the answer to anything. And the best that we can do is be empathetic to how other people live. And yeah, I mean, I, I do think some people have more empathy than other people. Yes, for sure. That. I agree. Yes, I, I totally agree. Uh, but but I think that the, the way to get there is to is to acknowledge that it is it is it is your ability to see how others um, how others are living right. that is the key, not their ability to see how you are living. Right. Like, you, like I like I have empathy. I don't agree with anything that they think, obviously, but I have empathy for like older people who are not like media literate, who like right? fell down a rabbit hole on YouTube and now think like crazy shit. Yes. Like crazy conspiracy things. Like I have a lot of empathy for that because like that, and and especially for their family members that are trying to like get through to them, and are just like they're like too far gone like yeah. i have empathy for that for those people when that happens to young people too it happens that like people like, yeah, like, like for you, sure. know, you know the world the earth is flat 9 nine eleven was an inside job like all that shit comes from youtube wormholes for you sure. know so. um but yeah it's it's i was just thinking about john lewis and the fact that like the edmund pettus bridge is still named after a confederate general and uh head of the alabama kkk like still and he's dead now and so like he you know he's he like fought for what he believed in for so long and now like politicians on, are going to like whitewash what he thought. And it's like, what a fighter, what a, what a good man and really stood up for what he believed in and, and bravery and stuff as like some of those politicians are actively working against the things that right. he fought for and his friends died for. And it's just, it, it like is nauseating to me. And so just like, you know, the, rest in peace, John Lewis and uh, keep the fight on. Rest in peace, John. The fight is never over. For for equality for all of us, the fight is never over. So I agree with you. Rest in peace, John Lewis. So uh, without any further ado, our talk with presidential candidate, <laughs> fucking ridiculous, yep. Andrew Yang. That's right. Yep. Um, well, Andrew, uh, it's an honor. I have to say, we we've, we've done this podcast for seven years, and we've had a lot of cool guests. But right before, right as Mike signed on, before you came on. I was like, hey, we're going to have a guy on that actually got votes for president. Like a, people wanted him to be president. That is pretty wild. So it's an honor. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah, I think that I'm up to something like 200,000 uh, official votes for my presidential campaign or something like that. And, and I think that there were more people that were into it. But obviously, like, I can see why they wouldn't vote for me now that I'm no longer. like. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So the fact that they voted for me, even though I'm already out, I mean, that's some freaking hardcore. So thank you, Yang Yang. Yeah. 
Is there yeah. a way to for you to reach out to all of them individually and thank them one by one? <laughs> you know, I mean, so when you vote, we, we can't really make that connection as immediately and directly, but hopefully they reach out to us on social media and then we, we can be in touch, uh, you know, with them one to one. So we wanted to start, obviously, so as, as you know, this is a, a basketball podcast, a Sixers podcast. We want to start there and then get progressively more serious as it goes on until it's too serious and you don't want to talk anymore. That's kind of the, the goal. I like this progression. Yeah. So <laughs> Pure levity to <laughs> stab your eyes right. bleak. Yeah. Um, and then, like, people who are listening to this can decide. It's like, how much can I? Spend? Yeah. Yeah. When am I? <laughs> when am I getting off the bus? <laughs> by the yeah, by the end, we'll all be like, you know, uh, like relating traumatic childhood experiences. Yeah, <laughs> crying. Everyone's crying. Calling yeah. our moms. Yeah. That's right. um, so why don't you give? I I assumed when I emailed and I, I've seen a couple of tweets. I assumed you're a Knicks fan. Why don't you give us like your 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 basketball basketball like Genesis, world sure. view yeah yeah so um i grew up in upstate new york and then uh and then the suburb of new york city so knicks fan um with my formative years being like the ewing starks oakley uh early 90s knicks so if you remember that stuff uh losing to jordan um in well, I mean, we lost Jordan a lot, so you could pretty much pick a year. But uh, <laughs> like the the, um, the '93 Knicks with the Charles Smith blocked layup and the rest of it was like emblazoned in my mind. I was uh, 18 at the time, um, and so there was a long period of time when I thought of the Knicks as like a, a proxy for how my life was going. And we made the playoffs every year for a while, so I was like, oh, my life's going pretty well. And like '94 was like a really good year, and um, that sort of thing. So, you know, uh, it, it's funny looking back now at how spoiled we were because the Knicks have been so fucking atrocious for so long. Um, so I saw basketball fandom through the lens of a Knicks fan for most of the time. I would like try and think, OK, how does this affect the Knicks? You know, if it's like if it was good for, let's say, the 76ers, it's bad for the Knicks. So, you know, it's like uh, like, like whatever happened was like, all. Oh, how does this affect my team? Um, and then, and I've written about this, then like I eventually uh, broke up with the Knicks in 2014 because we'd just been so bad and so corrupt and so mismanaged and we just dumped Jeremy Lin for money of all things. It's like, are you shitting me? Like this is the team that gave Jerome James like, you know, 30 million or like, <laughs> like whatever the basis of absolutely nothing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 and so the fact that they would, uh, get rid of Jeremy Lin, who like brought joy to the the fan base, um, and obviously, like as an Asian American dude who plays um, and loves basketball, seeing like uh, you know the lone Asian baller get dumped for money by your team, um, <laughs> was just like okay, this is the last straw. Like I put up with freaking um, Mike Sweetney and Frank Williams and like all this bullshit and like something good happened and then we got rid of it. Now I'm like, I just can't handle this anymore. What was um, the, so, that, so was the moment was Lynn sanity, those few weeks, months of, of Lynn sanity. Was that like, could you even believe it? It was awesome. I mean, that was definitely a lot of fun. Could I believe it? Um, Did it feel like it was an, it, it was like it had a clock on it. In because as Sixers fans, there's been a lot of like this feels good for a little, but in the back of your mind, you're like it's gonna end, it's gonna end badly. Like was that were you feeling that in the moment? Well, here here's what I was uh, envisioning. So I think we won like seven or eight games in a row, and I was uh, um, either engaged or just gotten married in that time frame. Um, and my wife not that into basketball, um, but she got ca caught up in insanity like everyone else um and so that was one of like the times where we shared the most uh, fun watching basketball together and so what i'd imagine was like okay are we gonna like, go like undefeated forever is jeremy then gonna like <laughs> you know just like never lose a basketball game it's like of course not um but what i imagined was that jeremy would be on the, the team and we would get to watch his career progress uh into whatever it was whether it became you know like um, regular all-star uh, rotation player, whatever it was. Uh, so 
Uh, certainly, it was a beautiful time. Didn't think it was going to last forever, but thought that there would be some version of it afterwards right. that we could uh, still enjoy together. Um, so we're, we're about – one of the things I get made fun of on this podcast is that this is a Sixers podcast, but I grew up until my mid-20s was a Knicks fan. Like I, that Right above me, you can, there's the Starks dunk uh, poster there. Oh, that was the greatest dog. Maybe one of the greatest in-game dogs of all time. Like, I, I think of all time. Yeah. I think. Were yeah. you? Everybody leans one way or another. Are you a Starks guy or a Ewing guy? Like in your heart, which one? Well, if you make that uh, distinction, yeah. I was a Starks guy right. for sure. Okay, okay. I do remember that dunk in '93 when he dunks over Jordan and the Bulls, or whatever. I remember the very next possession he came down and tried to do it again. Yeah. <laughs> you guys remember that? Like that was Starks. It's like I just dunked on these guys. Like I'm gonna do it again. Of course they put him on his ass. Like the the very next possession, like he's like goes to the basket. They, um, so if you had to choose between the two. Though that's very much an emotional decision mm -hmm. because you know that Ewing was a much bigger part of the Knicks' success uh, dur during that time. We would have been completely non-competitive without Ewing. Um, so I feel a little bit bad saying Starks, but uh, certainly Starks was like a lot more relatable and fun. I think for, for a lot of go people that like, you know, you think about a team and you think about oh, what, what makes a team special, you almost want to not say that the best player is your favorite or the mo the guy that you ride for, you know, in the same way that like, oh, I don't like the f the main band that everyone likes. Like, I like this other band. Like, this is the cool one. So like with the Sixers for years, it was always like, well, Iverson's obviously the guy, but like George Lynch is pretty good. Yeah. Like, I think George <laughs> Lynch actually has some talent to untap. Yeah, I think Iverson might not have been the most rootable of like those Sixers teams either. You know, it's like that, like you have like the random – uh, hardworking, scrappy, lunch pail player who's just cleaning up after Iverson is somehow more rootable <laughs> yeah. than, than Iverson. Well, we, just we, just had, we just had Larry Hughes on the podcast and just talking to him about like how many guys, like w what the version of Iverson and those teams were like, uh, and how they were be how Iverson was best utilized. And a lot of the time, it ended up being, especially in the '01 Finals run, was like guys that just didn't want to shoot or just didn't weren't allowed to. Or we're just like, go for it, man. Take 40 shots a game. We're not going to do anything. Uh, and when when you when he brought in other guys to like touch the ball or like handle it, it's like, no, 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 that's not going to work. That's going to be <laughs> that's going to be a problem. And so he was such a specific guy, and I think that it's a similar thing with with you know with Ewing at least. There was like he well he's the guy, but I kind of like this other one more because it's it's not as much as riding on him. Well, of those uh, those Knicks of that era. So many of them were so likable, probably more naturally likable than Ewing. Again, no offense uh, to him, but Oakley, love him. Mm -hmm. Mason, yeah. love him. Starks, love him. Chris uh, Childs? Chris Childs, love that dude. Um, like Charlie Ward? I, I was sort of irrationally, like, and, and this, was, this was something that didn't make much sense. I even liked Greg Anthony. Oh, I love Greg like, Anthony. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, like a, they started off one of those games against the Bulls. I feel like they started off like 20 to nothing in the beginning of the game, and I'll never forget Greg Anthony hitting a three to send it to a timeout. And, like, Greg Anthony was a good wait, player. Wait, Greg Anthony hitting the three to send it to a timeout and then, like, stumbling into Phil Jackson yes. by mistake yeah. and then realizing it was Phil Jackson and yeah. then, like, pumping it just in Phil Jackson's face. Yeah, yeah, I remember that even freaking possession. Yeah. Um, there were so many Knicks to love during that time. There's so much character uh, and toughness to the Knicks that, you know, so it's, it's kind of a tall order for Ewing because he's playing with a bunch of really likable dudes. Even, like, in every year, the Knicks would have one garbage dude they would bring in, like, rather bring in, like, Anthony Bonner, who really could do absolutely nothing but scrap. And he just bring in, like, one of those dudes every year. Uh, so did you pivot to the Nets, or did you become team agnostic, sort of? I had a very difficult basketball nomad period after that mm -hmm. uh, because I'd been such a hardcore Knicks fan for so long. And then when you're just, like – an NBA fan. <laughs> like it's actually kind of trickier. Uh, my brother was a Celtics fan because he went to school in Boston. I was like, definitely not. Uh, and, and then the, the nets, I actually did try the nets on for size. Um, though the, the nets were very hard to root for during that period. I mean, like, I, I think that was like the Darren Williams, Joe Johnson, Paul Pierce, like yeah. that era, like yeah. Gar Garnett, like the skeleton of Pierce and like the, you know, <laughs> like the ghost yeah. of Garnett. A great like, 2008 like, team in yeah. 2015. 
Yeah, so so then you're rooting for this team, and you're like, wow, the, these guys are like the least rootable team of all time, uh, because it was just like a bunch of. No, again, I mean, I li- love a lot of those players, but you know, they know. I mean, that team was hard to root for. It was like, um, it was just structurally unsound. It was people that were past their prime, etc. So that was hard. Like, I actually went to Nets games, and I'm I'm like a cheap Asian dude, so I was like, oh, this will be great because these tickets will be like less expensive than getting gouged to the garden and all this other stuff. And so I'd like go um, to to Barclays, which is a very nice arena. But it, it takes – it's like – it's difficult to switch teams. I mean, that's one reason why most people never do it. And if you never do it, more credit to you because switching teams sucks. Um, but I, I will say that breaking up with the Knicks was like the best decision for my mental and spiritual health I've ever made. Yeah. Because <laughs> like, like imagine if I'd been a hardcore fan from then till now. Uh, yeah. And I still keep track of the Knicks. Um, but there's not – there's just not that much to keep track of because it's like so comically mismanaged. And it's one reason why I love you guys and the name of this podcast and the spirit of it is that you guys could genuinely like have done like a million times better job than Nick's management over the last, <laughs> the last <laughs> number of years. Like pretty much like most of the people listening to your podcast could have done a better job than Nick's management the, over the last six years. So I have no bones about breaking up with them, but it was very hard to figure out the, your approach as an NBA fan after you essentially just wash your hands of your team. Yeah, for sure. I mean, we have a, a very... I would say maybe one-sided combative relationship with the Sixers <laughs> um, in that like they do dumb shit and have done dumb shit since I was born. Um, the three ish year period where they didn't do dumb shit, like was when Hinky was there and we had like that, that was, when was terrible. Like, well, was, like, right. And, but we're riding for this. Like we're riding for this dude. We believe in the, in the, in the process obviously. And the, and the, just the theory of what is happening rather than, you know, the, any specific individual player itself. But we got to the place when it was like, hey, we have these guys because of this dude. And now the people that are still there are only successful because of that three-year period because of Embiid and Simmons. And now we're like, well, we were freaking right, first of all. And who the hell are you guys benefiting from the thing that we were riding for in the past? Yeah, that it would be very hard to... Uh, reconcile those things because i'm a big sam hinky fan um i I don't think anyone who reads his resignation letter like uh and is savvy uh like can disagree with the fact it's like wow this guy is freaking next level in terms of his his thought process um and i remember the sixers during that time this says something about me too it's like i naturally rooted for the sixers during that time and and nice and i remember Tony Roten, be, you're, where you're like, wow, they discovered this freaking random dude who like, sure. j- just like, like street baller, dunker, lefty, canning threes in like random ways, and you're like, yeah, Tony <laughs> Roten, <laughs> like, like this guy, he just like won that game. Um, you're saying all the right find... stuff. Is this is a a like a Tony Roten podcast? Like basically, like if if it wasn't the rights to Ricky Sanchez, we would name it after Tony Roten. So definitely yeah, the right. I can see pick how those out. two would be vying yeah. for the, the title. <laughs> uh, and and so, but but it just goes to show too. It's like a lot of us, and certainly I think most people listen to this podcast. It's like I'm on board with this project. As long as I understand the thinking and the leadership and it's consistent, like I can live with a bad win loss record as long as there's a vision and I can see it and the decisions that are being made are sound. Uh, You know, it's like like fans are smart and have patience that way. It's really just when you're like fucking shit up right and left that you're just like, oh, rooting for you is impossible. Yeah. Uh, (laughs) So the the fact that you guys hunkered down, like I, I obviously would have been very happy being like, um, like a Sixers fan during that time. And then it's hard because now it, if you look at the decisions made after Hinky was gone and like, I, I, and I don't know as much about this as I should, but like Colangelo was a GM and did he get fired because of some weird shit? Like where he like, posted, <laughs> no, man. Well, like comments about him yeah. himself and like, uh, the rest yes. Of it. Yeah. Yes. He was, he was caught, uh, using or his wife using five burner accounts to, uh, basically shit post about, Players on the team and oh, yeah. uh, Masai Ujiri. And talk Ujiri. about how cool and handsome he was, yeah. right? And it's talk about how cool and handsome he is. That's right. Um, and oh, how normal his colors are, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it was a good. It was a good run. You should. You should. We'll send you a link of a uh, really, of a story on our on our site that really uh, sums it all up in a in a nice package of yeah. way. So, so I think you could 
pretty much safely assert like that was like an era of subpar leadership. <laughs> like, 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 like the, Solid assessment. Yeah. Solid. Yeah. Uh, and then was he replaced by Elton Brand? Is that right? Who who we love as a guy, but had never held a front office position in an NBA front office ever before. Uh, so yes, he was replaced by Elton. So yeah. So my read on things is like Hinky, analytical genius. You know, like uh, great at winning transactions, um, and then somehow ran out of runway with the ownership, left, gets replaced by Colangelo, who just seemed terrible to me. <laughs> and, and, then, and then Elton, to me, is like, I would say like something like inconclusive, TBD, not sure. It's like there are certain, it seems like there are certain things um, that you can get excited about, but then other things where you're like left scratching your head. Is that a reasonable, is that the consensus, what I just described? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, they've been. Um, we we talked to Larry Hughes about this. It was just the idea of like, and we've talked about it a lot. The the foundation that was here was solid, but maybe a little capped, as far as everything has to work out really well for this team, surrounded by Embiid and Simmons, but like good role players that know their spot around them. And then they were like, well, let's really go for it. And so they went and tried to get Jimmy. They went and tried to get Tobias. Now they that didn't half of that kind of didn't work out. And they went and got Al because they didn't have any backup center play. And they thought that like if Embiid's health is at risk, then at least we go get a Horford who is, you know, Embiid's to some extent kryptonite against Boston. And so it's like, well, how do we do it? And so it seems like they just like doubled down over and over again on this one thing. And it's like, well, you kind of just want to like rewind the tape and go like, let's go back to kind of the way it was. Like we were Things were fine. Like if you just like maybe like let it sit for a second, aside from like just doing, doing, doing. But here we are. Yeah, that, that's you know. I, I mean, you probably saw like I spoke to JJ Redick not that long ago. Uh, we're familiar. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, like, it, it seems like the Sixers, the Sixers are a strangely constructed team. <laughs> like, like, I mean, that's like what you gotta look at it and say this is a very odd team. Yeah. Uh, and but in a way, you don't blame them because they had these two anchor stars that uh, are just so distinct. Um, where if if you take as a given, your two major pillars are going to be jo- Joel Embiid and uh, Ben Simmons, then you have to really uh, get al- get everything else right. Essentially, if like those are your two anchors, because uh, they both have a combination of. Uh, you know that their games like Embiid has health issues where where you know like you figure he's gonna miss like X number of games a year. Sure. Um, it, it, you know they they're um a little bit throwbacky. You know they they don't they don't feel uh like the pace and space players of. <laughs> you know, yeah. Like that, there's like, a Knicks. There's a '90s Knicks physicality to them without, without the, the like. Basically. Without a little yeah. bit of like the like swagger, just like go get go get a bucket and go beat punch somebody in the mouth and and the togetherness that those Knicks I think played for with played with for a lot of that time. Yeah, the togetherness it, it's part of like the kind of strange chemistry. Um, e- even though you know too that like there was like a playoff run where they scared the shit out of everybody and it was just like oh man like that like 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 they could have. So I, I think right. someone just projected it. It's like. You don't, you're not surprised if the Sixer is losing the first round or make it to the finals. Like, anything is possible. Uh, and, like, can you blame? Like, what would I do if I were in, in that position, if you have Embiid and Simmons as your anchor players? I feel like both players, and this is, like, the tough decision that Sixers management's going to have to make, is, like, it's a lot easier to build a team around either one or the other than it is to try and build the team around both of those dudes. Like, I guess everyone's staring at the same thing and, and like, thinking that. Maybe I, am I, is what I just said controversial? No, the, people say it. I, I think the, the one thing that you would say is that it, they don't optimally com, com, uh, complement each other, but having guys that can shoot around them is probably the right thing. Like, you know, like, you know, six, eight guys that can shoot, and they instead just got a bunch of, power forwards and centers so um so they didn't they it if there is a way to do it they definitely didn't do it (laughs) that's very fair it's like you know (laughs) like we've executed poorly um so is uh, is it undoable uh and and the big question too in the nba is like could you possibly get fair value for either of those guys the answer is probably not right Uh, you know like like you almost never get fair value for any 
top tier superstar. Um, mm-hmm. uh, so, yeah, I mean, it's it's. I think they've done the right things in terms of like, if I were in their boat, I would be like, well, we got to build around these two guys because it's very rare you get two franchise level players. Exactly. Thank you, Hinky. Yeah, thank <laughs> you. There you go. There you go. The Rice to Ricky Sanchez podcast. We take a break from Andrew Yang, former presidential candidate. Sit right there, Mr. Yang. To fucking chill out for a second, Yang, um, is uh, Touchstone Home Products, Touchstone Electric Fireplaces, ZeroDeadBirds.com. Did you ever listen to his review of your, um, which, by the way, he emailed me right after he heard Frank from Touchstone. Right after he listened to the review in the pod, he was like, I feel like an asshole. My review was a little too harsh. No, no. Not no. what I meant to it was, do. It was delightful. I did yeah. listen to it. It was very charming. I sent it to Pat. He thought it was funny. Also, he's a very a nice, sweet man. Seems, yeah. seems like a very sweet guy. Yeah, he is. He is a, a, a great guy. Followed up this week, made his, his payments to uh, Coded by Kids in the Providence Animal Center for the, uh, for the script. He has a great voice. A couple of our listeners have written in that Frank's voice should be like very fireside chatty. It is interesting, his yeah. business. Yeah. So Touchstone, so uh, there are so many advantages to an electric fireplace and so many advantages to one from Touchstone. The advantages to an electric fireplace are numerous. First of all, you're not going to worry about any dead birds in your chimney. You don't have to fucking worry about a chimney. You're not going to have to worry about your your living room smelling like a campfire. You're not going to have to worry about cleaning up ash and dust in the front of your your fireplace. You're going to have the advantage of a fully controllable flame. You're going to have the warmth. You're going to have the look. It's going to be fucking... Uh, installed very easily. It's going to be in your wall. It's going to be like flush against your wall, like a, like you're going to look. It's going to look pretty dope. Um, and Touchstone is great because they're right here in the Delaware Valley. They're extant. Touchstone is great because their customer service is there all the time. Touchstone is great because they're going to get you your electric fireplace uh, like within two or three days. They're working. They're shipping now. Uh, go to zerodeadbirds.com. You look at the gallery. It just looks amazing. Any, and any space you're really looking for, anywhere from 36 inches wide to 100 inches wide, the flame intensities are, you just, you make it look like exactly how you want. And I know it's warm now, but before you know it, time is going by very quickly. Uh, it's going to be the fall and the winter. You're going to want, and there is warmth to an electric fireplace as well. Um, ZeroDeadBirds.com is where you want to go. Uh, Promo code TTP is what you want to use um, because it will give you 15% off. And by the way, like you're thinking about, well, how much is something like this? Uh, you're talking about anywhere from like 800 bucks to 1500 bucks. Like you're not talking about thousands and thousands of dollars to put one of these in your home. So uh, go to zerodeadbirds.com. If you have any questions at all, they're available by email. They're available by chat on the site. They're available by phone. Um, no and- maintenance, environmentally friendly. Totally environmentally friendly. And like I said, who wants to look up into their chimney and see a fucking dead bird? Not me. Not me. me. Uh, Go to zerodeadbirds.com. Promo code TTP, Touchstone Electric Fireplaces. Thank you, Touchstone. Back to Andrew Yang. Did you, did you, I was looking at the, I was looking at the presidential numbers and I was thinking about the Knicks. Have you considered the idea that you came closer to the presidency than the Knicks have come to a title since 2013. <laughs> you know, I have higher standards for myself than that, man. Yeah. I mean, I you, you've come closer to the presidency than the Knicks have come. To the <laughs> That's true. That's <laughs> honestly true. You, uh, you mentioned your podcast. Oh, wait, wait. Oh, let, let's just talk the Knicks for a minute oh, yeah. just for fun. Sure. Like, I don't know if you guys saw the beginning of the season. I was like, this is the worst time to be a Knicks fan in recorded history. This is just the worst. And then people actually disagreed with me. And I was like, this, this is just like the worst – composed team ever and this is from a guy who saw the knicks be terrible yeah, um, yeah but i was like at least the terrible teams like there was like at least the beginnings of some kind of logic or leadership or identity that you could sort of see but i was like this is the dumbest like hodgepodge of random mercenaries who are gonna need playing time and are inefficient and then you have like these random rookies that uh, or young players that are like cast offs of other teams that you have no idea if they're going to be any good. And I was like, this team makes zero sense. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, yeah. like instead of that, that was actually sort of a hinky thing. He was mostly like, why would we sign Todd Gibson when we, if we're going to suck anyway, let's, let's right. just throw another young guy in there and have all young guys and maybe more of them will work out. 
like just the right and then one elton brand or something yeah. like that instead of you know eight julius randall's and bobby portis yeah. is just like lying around <laughs> it know, really was people. bad it really was terrible and it was so desperate it was yeah. like you strike out on whoever you genuinely wanted uh and, okay so here, here was like let's just try to rewind to like summer nicks you have tons of cap room you just dumped porzingis for jack shit like dennis smith and like a bad mavericks draft pick or whatever mm -hmm. like all nba yep. fans were like what just happened there so first you're just like that was your best offer for for porzingis who clearly could become awesome um and so you're, not, you're like no we did it for the cap space so then if you're a rational fan you're like well they must know they're going to get someone then <laughs> because like, like there's yeah. no other reason you would do this yeah. uh, so we're all scratch our chin being like maybe they'll get durant maybe they'll get whoever and then you get nobody um and, and so at that point then um to me one possible direction to go is like okay look we're gonna overpay for some guys that at least then we're gonna actually have on the team for a while um so one one thought in my mind at the time was like look the nets are gonna dump d'angelo russell just get d'angelo russell mm -hmm. like he obviously loves new york he'll have some fans he's young like, is he like a world beater? No, but at least makes sense. Like, you know, like you can have him on your team and start to, and then if I'm a fan, I'm like, okay, I get it. I'm rooting for like the D'Angelo Russell and like, what's who's another dude who's in the same class that they could have gotten that it's like, I've, I'm just gonna max out a person that you're kind of like, well, I don't love maxing this guy out, but at least now you know who your team is kind of thing. I mean, Jim, Jimmy right. Butler was there, uh, who was a sixer, um, you know, like he was out there. I'm trying to think. He never, he never would have signed with a shitty Nick. So. Uh, <laughs> <you know. laughs> maybe like a, maybe like a Malcolm Brogdon. Yeah. Maybe like a boy on Bogdanovich. Type yes. Deal. If you just dumped truckloads of money on D'Angelo Russell and Brogdon, if you were the Knicks, then at least if you're a Knicks fan, you're like, okay, this is not like what I was hoping for. But right. at least I now know who I'm supposed to root for. Right, <laughs> like, right, yeah. like, like I know who my team is. Like that. They're, they're, they're just like looking only, and this is what the Sixers did in you know most of the 2000s, is that they were only looking one year ahead always with very few options. And when those like top tier unlikely options don't pan out, which they almost never do, then they're like, ah, oh, fuck. Okay, well, next year, next year, next year, next year. Next year we got next. So they sign a bunch of guys to one year deals, and it's just like, well, nothing cohesive is coming together out of this. And, and as a fan, it's miserable because it's like, why am I going to give it? And that's the thing that, that, that infuriated me so much is like, okay, the Knicks are terrible. So you give playing time to like Emmanuel Moutier and Trey Burke right. um, uh, and, and these guys. And it's like, I don't hate it. Uh, but then if those guys pan out, sign one of them so that if I'm a fan, I'm like, OK, like you discovered someone and now we're going to be rewarded for the fact that Noah Vonley is an NBA player. <laughs> <laughs> you know. But instead, it's like I sign a bunch of randos and even if they, quote unquote, work out, they they like head to the Nuggets to be the backup point guard or whatever the hell. It's like, what was the point of my paying attention to this team at all right. if, if like... Okay. Can so like at least let me know who's gonna who's going to be like. Uh, <laughs> well, let me let me be honest with you. You you said you separated yourself from the Knicks in 2014, but the last four minutes of this Doesn't podcast like it. makes it sound like that is not true. That in your heart <laughs> the Knicks are still there. Like, uh, I that I you know can't like you know, it's just like uh, a lot of things in life. It's like you can break up with someone, but like, yeah. you know, like still checking their face. They're still, still there page. somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I, the other thing is like, I'm just, uh, I, I just like information and synthesizing it. So like, you know, it's like, even though I'm not a Knicks fan, it's like, do I like check uh, in every once in a while just to, to see what's going on? Like, sure. You know, like, uh, but I, I do that. Yeah. I, I guess I sound defensive right now. It's like, yeah, I check it on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Had you, had you like, okay, had you won the presidency and friggin' James Dolan comes to a fundraiser of yours, what do you say to James Ooh. Dolan? I'm mean, like, Jimmy, you have to sell that team, please, <laughs> for all of our sakes. Please, please, please just sell the team. You can use, the money, like... you can use the money to buy fans for your shitty band. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I will adjust policy based on you selling the team. This is the one backroom deal that you would be willing to to lay on the table. 
I, I mean, I, I would genuinely say, look, it, it's a matter of public interest for you to sell this. Team, so, like, what, so what can we do? <laughs> you know, like you want to hang out in the Lincoln bedroom? <laughs> like, so, <laughs> my God. I, like what, what, I don't know what James Dolan's hopes and dreams are. I mean, I do think that they have something to do with his band. Yes, they do. Um, so, so that it could be like that. I got it. It'd be like, Jimmy, if you sell this team, we will have you open for, um, cold play <laughs> yeah. I, guess he could, I guess he might be able to make yeah. it happen by himself because like you know he could probably get someone to play in the guard and be like guess who your opening act is it's uh jd it's and the straight shot or whatever the hell his right. band is named <laughs> when when i see like new political figures i go through like a long wave of skepticism at first like how full of shit is this person how much integrity or morality did they sacrifice or have to sacrifice to get here get here do you ever feel that about other politicians and did you feel that like emanating from people initiate initially reacting to you uh i feel for other politicians because when you get into uh, politics you wind up just getting your hands tied very quickly in terms of uh owing folks stuff um, it's one of the reasons why I was so grateful to the Yang Gang and everyone who supported my campaign. So if you're listening to this and you support me, thank you. One buck, thank you. Uh, because there was a point when I actually felt uh, like I could be free to do what I what I set out to do, in part because I didn't have to suck up to folks. Uh, but if you've been in politics at a local level or whatever, you owe so many people so many things. Uh, and it ends up... Um, dehumanizing you in a particular way uh and and i experienced my version of that on the campaign trail even though i was free of any corporate influence and the rest of it um just in the fact you have dozens of people working for you um or in my case hundreds eventually and uh you you owe them um and so like you're you're doing things i like i owed the hundreds of thousands of people in the yang gang you know like uh my my um best shot at winning um, the, the White House. So that's like the wholesome sort of set of incentives. But there's a very dark, perverse set of incentives that most politicians become subject to really quickly. And part of it is um, the like part of it's your team, part of it's uh, the media, where uh, your team, uh, like people who work on political campaigns, um, they will steer their candidates. And this is like a basketball analogy. Um, I'll use NFL for, for fun. Um, so let's say I'm the NF I'm the coach of like a shitty NFL team and we're going out and getting our asses kicked all the time. Um, now, if it was you, if it was us, one of the three of us, you might be like, fuck it, we're going to lose. Let's like do some crazy trick plays. Let's like wildcat it. Let's do something that gives ourselves a chance to win. Um, and, and like the professional political staffers are like the NBA coaches who are like, no, just lose conventionally. <laughs> so... Um, so I can get another yeah. job after this campaign. <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> like I'm much better off with with us just going by the playbook and just losing in a conventional. So, um, so I, I I feel for the folks who have been in politics for a while because even if you set out with good intentions, you can become trapped like a fly in amber over time. Well, so you made I, I was actually going to make a, a sports analogy there. So one of the when general managers and coaches seem to do the worst job, it's when they seem to be, when they're only focused on keeping their job, right? And when they're at the end of their yeah. contract, right? And that's a great pre comparison. Right. And so politicians are always at the end always. of their contract, right? Yeah. So, so how, I guess, do you, you know, you, you were not a politician, right? So if you didn't win, you can go back to doing whatever you were doing. But politicians cannot. Right. Or they could, but they've been doing this for so long. So how how do you fix that? You know, how do you make it so their their only goal isn't to just continue to have their job? This is one of the big problems. Uh, and the, the, the problem for many politicians is being that whatever you are, congressman, state senator, like a uh, city council person. The problem is that is the best job they'll ever have. Mm -hmm. uh, and and a lot of people really get off on having that job. Uh, and so then they'll do anything to keep the job. Um, so to your point, how do you fix it? I mean, the obvious one is term limits. Just be like, look, guess what? You can be a member of Congress for 
two, three terms, and then you're out. Right. Uh, and if you think of the members of Congress you recognize, like um, Nancy Pelosi or Chuck Schumer or whomever, uh, a lot of them have been there for decades. You know, like you would fundamentally change the makeup of Congress, but also the incentives of the people who are in Congress if they knew that they couldn't stick around past a certain point. Uh, so I'm pro term limits for that reason. Uh, I'm also for massive pay raises for regulators because right now their incentives are to go easy on everyone because then they're going to get offered a job afterwards. Right. And if they, you know, so as long as they play nice, then they can uh, do their two years of getting paid not that much uh, in government. And then it's like, all right, just like cash me out uh, when I'm out. Uh, so that there are some real structural problems that keep our government from functioning in a way that would actually serve uh, people, really. And the, the sports comparison is excellent. Did you, uh, during your presidential run, how often were you just saying, like, this fucking sucks? Oh, that, I mean, I was either saying it or thinking it. <laughs> 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 you know, like, you know, um, not... Uh, infrequently, um, but uh, the 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 that part was counterbalanced by the fact you'd show up and there'd be like dozens or hundreds or in some cases even thousands of people that were really excited about you, your campaign. Yeah. Um, so that you get like supercharged in particular ways, and uh, you're willing to put up with uh, like a lot of stuff. I gotta say, uh, and I'm I'm so grateful again to everyone who supported me. It's like I I set out on this journey and I was like I'm gonna fight fight fight. Um, and uh, the fact that it did not suck um, like it was something I was grateful for because when I set out, I was like, okay, Andrew, brace yourself to show up and no one gives a shit about you and it's like the dead of winter and you're away from your family and you're like, what am I doing here? Just brace yourself for that mm -hmm. for two years. Um, and so the fact that it wasn't quite that bad like, uh, or that like there were like crowds of, of supporters like i was grateful every day that it wasn't like the dark version because i was prepared for the dark version because i'm not crazy and like i'm like a rational dude so it's like if you run for president as someone no, no one's ever heard of like the realistic expectation is not like like crowds of thousands <laughs> you <Yeah. know? laughs> like, it's like it's like I, I hope i can get traction um yeah i mean uh so i i was very grateful but there were very difficult times regularly and then any given day let's say you had six or seven town halls scheduled the town halls might be an hour apart from each other so you'd be sitting in a rental car for six or seven hours that day um and so on even like a good day when you're like you finish an event and then you get into the suv and then you're like like eating granola bars or like uh or, or something um and like, uh, you know, texting with your wife or whatever, like there are times where like it's just tough on your um, like mental state, emotional health, like diet, like whatever the heck you, you would do in, in a normal situation. It sounds like really just being a Sixers or Knicks fan at any given time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's some comparisons there. Yeah. Too. Uh, I agree. Uh, um, though, though in my case, what was it? It's like I felt like you know, it's one of the funny things. Like, I was the principal, you know, like, I get a great team around me. Um, but there were a lot of times where you felt like you just didn't have a choice or didn't have control, despite the fact that I think I had greater discretion than any other candidate in the field because, you know, I could say something a little bit offbeat and, like, people are like, yeah, whatever, this is Yang. Um, <laughs> uh, and, and so, like, I think that's the, the tough part about being a sports fan sometimes is, like, you feel like you don't have – uh, any control you know it's like you invest in this team and then if they say or do something where you're like oh that that wasn't a great call <laughs> it's, uh, um, like uh, it yeah um it, it's better when you feel like you have agency in it you know i uh, you were the so like uh, m much like a lot of americans like i have the things that are important to me everybody has the things that are important to them and you look for somebody to say those things right like to say that that is important and uh, you are the only presidential candidate to mention what a threat automation is and how big a deal it was. To me, it seems like so obvious and scary that, you know, 
I, I run a sports radio station. We have a website too. And I, I tell the, the writers for our website sometimes, I was like, you know, it's not just like toll booths that they automate, you know, they can write articles now too. So I guess my, my question is, is why isn't it a bigger um, thing? Like why don't people talk about it? And what do you think the resistance is, at least from the public, from, from comprehending what could happen in the next, you know, six to 10 years? Most Americans now, a majority of Americans, believe that automation is going to get rid of a lot of jobs because uh, we're smart. You ask Americans what's going on. Now, I will say also a uh, vast majority of Americans don't think it will affect their job. Right. So that just shows like the cognitive dissonance. It's like, well, it's going to affect most jobs. Like, why not you? And I've been in conversations with people who had, frankly, the most automatable job in the universe it's like i literally just, just like take stacks of paper and move them here and like be like well my job's safe <laughs> like, uh, uh, so the the thing i would press on really uh, is for members of the media in particular when you talk about like they can automate away like article writing um over a thousand local papers have gone out of business over the last number of years uh and even the media companies you think of as successful are dying you know, this like hemorrhaging people in, in, in various ways. Uh, and and uh, the economy is shifting. And, like, you don't even need to necessarily automate away the journalist to see the journalism jobs dying. Right. Uh, like, it, it's the same thing with retail. It's like, it's not like there's a robot mall clerk, but the robots are in the Amazon fulfillment center making it so that the mall doesn't make sense anymore. Right. Um, so we're, we're all getting affected in these different ways. And... To me, our political class would never call it because it's in no one's interest to call it. Right. Um, and, and one of the things that I'm that I was struggling with that I still struggle with, uh, honestly, is like the, the folks in in our legislator legislatures, um, they don't understand technology in the least. I mean, the, the average age of a member of Congress, I think, is something like 62, something along those lines. Um, that there are people you see on TV who are like leaders of our country who've literally never even read their own email, um, or, or like like they they don't understand technology in the least, um, and then most of them actually also don't understand the way tech, uh, the economy works. So if you say like, hey, do you understand how technology and the economy fit together? It's like, psh, <laughs> like, like, like <laughs> these people, it's like nowhere near. Um, so. Uh, so I think so. The charitable reason why no one talks about it is that they don't understand it. Um, the uncharitable reason is that like no one's paying them to say it. Um, if anything, they're going to get paid not to say it. Uh, so you could take which I whichever interpretation you want, but I had an instinct that if I didn't talk about it, no one was going to talk about it. Um, and and I think that that was true this cycle for sure. And the Rice to Ricky Sanchez podcast. Andrew Yang, you're going to hold on for a second so we can Hang talk. Hang on. About- Time for jewelry, Yang. Yeah, we got to talk about Lee Paborski. We're up at 186 mm. rings sold to Rice to Ricky Sanchez listeners um, from L.L. Paborski. Uh, two personal stories, actually. Uh, one, a co-worker of mine whose wedding um, got canceled due to uh, COVID-19, still needs wedding bands, sent me a text. He's like, hey, by the way, heading over to LL for wedding bands this week. I'm like, "Wow, LL's got to text you. you going to take care of you. And then a family friend uh, texted me and was like, hey, um, I heard you have a jeweler. And it's like, of course I have a jeweler. It's LL Pavorsky. And he was like, he was like, look, I'm just going to be honest here. All I care about is price. <laughs> and I'm like, well, that's fine. <laughs> That's fine. He's going to take care of you with that too. He is, uh, he's open. The store is open by appointment only. And, and really here's the thing is that most jewelry stores, you walk in there and salespeople are right on you. LL Pavorsky, even if it wasn't by appointment, you're not talking about salespeople upon salespeople. You're talking about the actual owner who's taking care of you. LL Pavorsky with a mask and a facial shield and anything else you want. If you want him to be in a Tyrex suit, that's what he'll be in. Um, you want them to stay 25 feet away, not six feet away. That's what it'll do. And if you want to do it online, he will do the meeting with you online too. Um, just send him an, uh, an email, lee at llpavorsky.com. And with the email, send a compliment to young Jake for pulling off what seemed to be a pretty flawless TBT. Pretty unbelievable. Like it, it gave me hope. 
that yeah. that TBT um, and and Emma like like congratulations Jake Bavorsky like truly congratulations Jake. Uh, part of me hopes that there's a big scandal to uncover <laughs> that he's responsible for. Only part of me hopes that. Part of me wants to just be proud of him. So Jake Pavorsky, <clears throat> who is LL's son, if you're just listening to this for the first time, and really the 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 glue that brought LL to the Ricky is now like a bigwig in TBT, even though he's 14 years old. And TBT really like pulls off basketball before the NBA does, has a fucking wild final game. Like truly a wild final game for a million bucks. I would have yeah. never guessed that TBT would have survived this entire time and then yeah. pulled off the, the pandemic tournament. So I watched I watched a bunch. It was it was great. It was awesome. It was real basketball. It's legit yeah. basketball. Yeah. It's it's that zone, because you know I don't like college basketball, but it's that zone in between NBA and college that I can watch. I would say it was as good, if not better, than G League basketball, I thought, or, or right around G League basketball, I thought. Yeah, around. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so congratulations, Jake. Anyway, LL Pavorsky, he's your guy. He's the one that's going to take care of you uh, if you need an engagement ring, um, or if you need a son who who wants to pull off a basketball tournament. Two one five six two seven two two five two. I mentioned Lee at LLPavorsky dot com. The store is uh, seven zero seven Walnut, coded by Kids Providence Animal Center. Always. Um, beneficiaries of Lee's sponsorship of the pod. LL Pavorsky Jewelers. Yang, you're going to like this one. My chief of clasp. <laughs> chief of clasp. I got it. Back to the Ricky. You, uh, you're a big proponent for universal basic income, uh, which you named the a freedom dividend, which sounds a, uh, a little flag humpy for me, but <laughs> I, I, like the, I like it in principle. Uh, have you um, been taking any victory laps in the fact that uh, there needs to be universal basic income, especially in a pandemic? And, and would you say that most of the problems with the pandemic response stem from the fact that our government refuses to do what many, many other countries are doing, which is just paying people to stay home to stop the spread of the virus? Now, 74% of Americans are for cash relief right now. And if you think about it, I mean, how can you get higher than 74% in 2020? You know what yeah. I mean? That's like as high as they're going to prove anything under the sun. Um, so it's certainly not a victory lap. I'm just glad that we could advance universal basic income uh, when the country needed it. And we need it now. We should pass it immediately. Uh, any member of Congress who's not for cash relief to me is just brain dead because uh, it's popular, it's direct, it's effective. Every other country is doing it. We should do it. We're spending trillions of dollars bailing out giant companies and banks that don't really need the money uh, while there are tens of millions of American families that have no idea what's going to happen next. So uh, it makes me really angry and frustrated that Congress is not doing the obvious right thing. Um, but I I'm really glad that my campaign helped mainstream uh, this solution right as we needed it well it's funny too to look at the the crash in uh in 08 where we chose to give the money to the banks rather than to people to just pay off their houses and then they would have had a house and yes. the banks would have had their money right like it was, seems like a, a better solution than somebody without a house and the banks with the money you know so yeah uh, it, it and that that actually is something i talked about on the trail all the time uh spike which is like uh Look, do you remember voting for the $4 trillion bailout of Wall Street uh, during the crisis? And everyone's looking around as like an uneasy laugh. And I was like, none of us voted for that shit. Right. It's like, and then I say, if you had a choice between bailing out the banks or keeping Americans in their homes, which would you have chosen? Uh, and it, it's obvious we just keep people in their homes. But instead, we just push the money to the banks, let people lose their homes. And then this is the dark part that a lot of people don't know. Then a bunch of private equity investors bought all the homes right. for, the, you know, like 50 cents on the dollar. Uh, and so they made money both coming and going while people's lives and communities got destroyed. This country makes me so angry sometimes uh, where, you know, and, and like this stuff is why I ran where I'm like, like, you know, like just the fact we say like any of your listeners could have run the Knicks better than, than the actual Knicks manager the last six years. Like, it's true for our country, too, in many respects. It's like <laughs> if you rounded up a bunch of, like, reasonable people being like, hey, what do you think? Bail out the banks or, like, keep people in their homes? Like, how many of them would be, like, the banks? Like, yeah. you know, <laughs> <laughs> like, it, it's, 
like, like we let some insane shit happen here in the United States of America, and um, like it, it, it's one reason why I think I did as well as I did is because a lot of reasonable people were like, hey, like he seems to be like a, a like talking about so stuff like a human being and have like seems to have like um, you know like some level of independent judgment. Well, the thing that looks so crazy to me is so Mike works in TV, and I used to work in music radio, and the biggest TV show now is like not nearly as big as the, the biggest TV show was 25 years ago. And same with, with bands and all that, because the internet has provided people like these little, they can find exactly what they want, right? But for some reason in politics, it's become like what happened with movies where like, it's just superhero movies, right? So we just wound up with these two parties, even though nobody really seems to, um, have a, a complete love those parties right <laughs> yeah like, so, so you really just end up with a lot of like mm, extremists on both sides who who subscribe to every single thing in there so i guess you know the obvious answer is oh there should be more parties and things like that and you've um advocated for ranked voting and and things like that um isn't it really though that the the reason that we're still like this is because those parties need us like this or they're just not viable anymore well they, they they have their own set of organizational incentives um and and this is this is the quickest way to understand what's gone wrong in american life is that you have an organization you have an organization's purpose so um the organization will actually serve its own goals like let's say for example the enrichment of the people in that organization then it will the the actual purpose and goals of the organization mm -hmm. so you have two political parties that uh, that will succeed whether or not people are flourishing or disintegrating uh, in America. Um, and so they don't care that much whether we flourish or disintegrate because it turns out they'll, they'll be fine either way. Uh, and so these political parties don't actually need to pay attention to like a whole lot of people. Um, they're just like a relatively narrow band of folks that are plugged in and go to the same cocktail parties. Um, meanwhile, more Americans now self-identify as independent than either Democrat or Republican. Uh, so both parties are losing the thread. Um, our duopoly doesn't reflect what people care about, and it kicks a lot of people out of the process because we're all like, well, uh, you know, I have these two choices in this case, in this presidential run. It's just Trump or Biden. Uh, so we need to reform how we actually can express our preferences. And hopefully I think, as you said, uh, Spike, ranked choice voting to me is like the big change because then you'd have a much more vibrant democracy um, where it could look like other countries do where you have like mini parties coming up and they have to get together and like uh, work with each other. Um, and you'd have politicians who have to be much more responsive to different points of view. Whereas right now they can just cater to like the, hey, I'm going to get 58% of you this way and, and mm -hmm. the rest of you can fuck off. Um, you know, we're, so the question is, how can we get ranked choice voting across the finish line when it doesn't necessarily help the people who are currently in control? Uh, and, and this to me is one of the major projects where if we can convince, let's say, Democrats that, look, ranked choice voting is better for you. Um, and then we actually get it across the finish line. Um, it could change everything. But in the absence of this, you're right that we're going to be left with this two-party duopoly that doesn't reflect the views of, at this point, probably a majority of Americans. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm Jewish, and Hitler's back in the conversation, which is uh, not what you want. Um, <laughs> how much does it suck that, uh, and the answer is a lot, but ha that Asian Americans are having to deal with like bigoted assholes blaming them for the coronavirus in a time like this? Yeah, it's uh, the last thing you need or want. Uh, you know, I mean, I try and have perspective on it where uh, the fact is black Americans are dying of coronavirus at like something like four to five times the rate of uh, other Americans. And if I had a choice between dying at like crazy rates uh, or having, uh, you know, getting shot for jogging in the wrong neighborhood um, or, or ha having a degree of hostility directed at me because I, I'm Asian. Like, you know, it, I mean, it's all evil. It's all terrible. Uh, but 
That's not know, a to, ranked choice, though. Situation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't need yeah, to rank yeah, yeah. It, but but it's like you know, I mean, to me, this is a terrible time for everyone. We just have to like help everyone in the ways that we can. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I I certainly have sensed like a different level of um, hostility towards Asian Americans during this time than than I I, I can remember. Um, but like I I think if we can beat the coronavirus, then hopefully that will fade. Uh, and I'm just here to try and help as many people as I can. Um, yeah, it, it is, it is the last thing you want though. I mean, uh, you know, like I, I grew up son, the son of immigrants in this country and love this country. Um, my kids are going to grow up in this country. I mean, like we just have to make it so that everyone feels like this is our home. Um, Rather than me explain it, could you explain, because I have a couple of questions about it, could you explain the data dividend project um, to people listening? Sure. Uh, so right now, our data is getting sold and resold by tech companies and data brokers to the tune of $200 billion a year. Uh, it's like data is the new oil, and it's our data, and we're not seeing a dime. So how do you change that? Ideally, we'd have different rules around data as our property, uh, but I've started something called the Data Dividend Project with some help um, that's going to try and get the tech companies to pay us for our data. Now, how the heck do we do that? Um, it's going to be a lot easier for the fact there's a new law in California and Nevada that says that if you use our data, you have to tell us all the stuff about what you're doing. And right now, no one's complying <laughs> because it's brand new. Uh, and so we think that we can go to these tech companies and data brokers and say, look, you owe all of our people these disclosures and these audit trails and then negotiate with them to get money for your data. Uh, so that's the plan. That's the data dividend project. Uh, and if that sounds appealing to folks listening to this, then feel free to sign up and join us because we're just trying to get you paid for your data. Well, it's funny. to So my wife used to do these things where she would like fill out questionnaires and get like a check every month, you know, she get like a $12 check. And now they don't even have to make you fill out the questionnaire, they get all of your information, you know, people hit the terms of service thing, and they don't realize what they're agreeing to. Um, it So there was between what you just spoke about with that a dividend project, and then the Facebook boycott in July of advertisers who um, wanted Facebook to take action against hate speech. What it seems like to me is that the the problem isn't so much that these data companies, or namely Facebook, Google, make the wrong decisions. The problem is that their decisions are are so are so uh, like they make decisions for people, uh, for so many people, without them having a, a choice. So is it is it we we make these companies make better choices, or we don't allow companies to to get that big or do what they do at all? If you had intelligent regulation, um, you would make it so that companies aren't making so many choices on our behalf. Uh, like one, one thing that people complain about with the data dividend is like, look, like us getting paid is not enough. We should be doing more. Um, and I agree with that. It's like if you had intelligent regulation, these tech companies would not have as much control um, of many aspects of our uh, daily interactions and, and it sounds like that oh, it's like oh you know it sounds like a lot i mean these data companies know so much about us now um and they can advertise to you we've all had that experience where like you'll be having some email conversation about something and then all of a sudden you go to a site and all of a sudden they're you know it's like you had a you said beach vacation in your email and all of a sudden like everything you see are like freaking <laughs> like like aruba ads or whatever yeah. and you're like oh that's a little weird <laughs> like um, uh, and so we need better regulations for sure, um, uh, because it, right now this situation is bad for our democracy, our mental health, our free will. Uh, you know, like we have to get into the guts of what's being done to our data. And again, $200 billion a year, you know, I mean, like you have like a company like Facebook making $70 billion a year. It's virtually all ad money, um, and it's made on the backs of our data. So you're there, and you're like, hey, this is free, so it must be a great deal for me. It's like, but then, like, where is this $70 billion 
coming from it's coming from us coming from reaching us yeah so at this point we should be getting paid by facebook to show up <laughs> really, really like, like that's legitimately it. it's like oh this is free this must be great it's like actually you're you're like at minus 70 billion <laughs> well isn't the phrase if uh if it's free the product is you right isn't that how the uh the saying goes yeah that's on facebook's homepage. yeah <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, if people haven't uh, broken down crying yet or jumped off the off the bus, um, yeah. <laughs> there have, have been, we done uh, it? <laughs> there have been uh, videos online of militarized federal agents with like no indication of what department they're from, just like showing up to protests and assuming the role of police, basically kidnapping people uh, since we don't know where they're taking them in like minivans or whatever. Uh, first of all, um, what the fuck? Um, second, like what can be done? about this yeah we, we should have certainly clear rules of engagement where you have to be able to identify yourself and like uh let people know what their rights are and warn them and um i i know the footage and stories you're talking about it's very very dark uh you oh, know we just saw footage for sure the, the other day of like folks who uh who were blinded in protests by uh, various police action uh and you see that and you're like this is a this is, is uh, unconscionable that it happened to folks who are just showing up and, and protesting for other Americans. Uh, my suggestion was that um, we, and this, this to some people listening to this be like, oh, this won't solve the problem, but that, that we need like a, uh, a set group in the Department of Justice that's just designed to curb um, police abuses and law enforcement abuses. Now, what you're describing might not even fall into this bucket, but when I, I looked at the numbers on how many complaints are brought against police departments nationwide, uh, civil suits that are successful in the United States of America total more than a billion a year. And it's a very, very high legal standard to successfully sue a police officer. You can imagine what that would be like, trying to sue a cop mm -hmm. or, or a police department. So the fact that you actually see successful suits of a billion dollars a year means the true nature of the problem is multiple billions of dollars a year. City of New York spends hundreds of millions of dollars a year just settling police misconduct lawsuits. It's one of their bigger expense items. So if you have a national problem at this level, then to me, you need a dedicated federal force to just, just say, look, I'm not beholden to any local influence, the district attorney, doesn't need to, you know, be scared about like their job if they cross local cops. Like, let us do it instead. Uh, so, th so that's to me the most effective solution. Even though to some people listening to this would be like, well, like, isn't that compounding the problem? Because if you don't trust the authorities, then the other approach that people would have is like, well, then let's just get rid of the authorities. Um, but, you know, to me, like, there has to be some approach that uh, really takes on a combination of those things because. We have definitely over militarized the police. We've overspent on the police. We have underspent on people showing up because a lot of these police interactions, you don't need an armed cop showing up to, you know what I mean? Like if, if someone's drunk, if someone's um, asleep in a car at Wendy's, if someone's um, you know having like a, a drug addiction episode or like a, a lot of other things, it's like uh, in Portland, they send freaking drug counselors and crisis counselors who don't have guns uh, and then you have uh, a much higher chance of actually getting help and, and not having something terrible happen. Well, what's interesting is that they're not, <clears throat> that's a matter of training too, you know, like police officers are, you know, trained for six weeks or two months and then that's the last training they ever do. Um, and they're sent to situations where like, it's the wrong person. It's the wrong person for the wrong thing. And the, um, like there's a lot wrong with it. And I, I, it's interesting. You mentioned a federal thing is that I think most people are surprised to find out that these police departments all across the country are not really connected in any way. There's not really like a, oh, no, they're, they're very independent. Yeah. Yeah. Which is like any given town just has their own practices. Uh, you know, I think the numbers are something like there are 670,000 police officers nationwide and something like, um, 60,000 departments or whatnot. So it, it's, it's hard to uh, fix this problem in part because it's just so spread out. Uh, I'll end on something nice. If, if you want to talk about Mitchell Robinson, like I'll just, yeah. <laughs> just like, go for it. 
Um, Mitchell Robinson, the bright spot of the Knicks for the last X years. I you know like the tough part about building a team now too is like all the contracts are so much shorter. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it's like you and so you get these people in. Like I'm scared that by the time Mitchell Robinson's any good, that Knicks team is like. <laughs> you know, I mean, um, but I, I like uh, he is a bright spot. Let's talk about the Sixers, and we'll try and close out on something positive. Yeah. Um, wow. Or really like that the NBA bubble. Um, I'll, actually, I'll share something with you. I don't know if this is going to be like, uh, like, uh, um, oh, I like watching this because you're trying to figure out how to say something you don't know if you should say or not. That's what I. Yeah, say. yeah, that's pretty much it. Yeah, uh, <laughs> that's one of the like, that's one of the special trading modules of running for president. Yeah, uh, <laughs> is that you get privy to all sorts of things. Yeah. Like, uh, um. Yeah, I mean, I, I we I've missed sports a great deal over the last number of weeks and months. I, I know you guys have too, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, hopefully we can get back to a point where we can actually enjoy simple things in life without uh, feeling like there's a giant caveat attached to each of them. Right. Um, I like my sports uh, with less dread. Yes, I like my days with less dread. Uh, but you know, one reason why I I wanted to do this podcast is like I thought I'd instinctively like you guys, which I do. Um, and most everyone who listens to this podcast, because I'm, I feel like I'm cut from the exact same cloth, like hoops fan. I consider myself somewhat, um, analytical, uh, you know, like, uh, I, I care about people making, um, rational decisions. <laughs> you know? Well, and, your, your merch says math on it, and this is basically a <laughs> hinky pod- podcast. So it fits, it fits perfectly. You know, and, and Sam Hinkie is one person. One of the fun things about running for president is you get to meet a lot of folks who um, you looked up to and admired in other contexts. But Sam Hinkie is one person, like, I haven't had a chance to meet, and uh, I'd enjoy that because I feel like that guy should be put put in charge. I'll actually make this pledge to you and, and your audience. If Andrew Yang becomes president, I'm going to put Sam Hinkie in charge of, like, an entire freaking... <laughs> Uh, <laughs> like department, agency, part of government. People will be like, Andrew, like, what does Sam Hinkie know about uh, national security or the Department of the Interior or energy? I'll be like, Sam Hankey is going to figure it the fuck out. Yeah. yeah. So this will be my pledge that the Yang administration, if it uh, comes to pass, will have Sam Hinkie in a position of major authority. Wow. 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 What, a, what a fig leaf. Yeah. Um, so we actually have one thing we want you to end on um, that we like to do to our, our most special guests. It's a it's been a feature of the podcast for a while, and it's called uh, Jigsaw. And basically what it is, it's a would you rather um, and uh, both choices are horrible, um, as many would you rathers are. So are, are you prepared? You ready? Yes. OK. Play. I will play this game. Game we play. I will play this game. I miss you. I will play this game. I- I'm worried. Play. I will play this game. And after the game, they were interviewing him, and they said, "How does it feel to win the ultimate game?" And he said, "If it's the ultimate game, why are they playing it again next year?" So your four, your first choice, and both of these choices are for the rest of your lives, um, for the rest of your life rather. So the first choice is you've got to get both of your ears pierced 13 times. And you have to wear earrings in all of those holes in mm. perpetuity. You also have to regularly change the earrings so people notice that you're wearing different earrings. Um, that is the first option. The second option is, for the rest of your life, once a week, at a, on a random day, a person is selected, and that person gets to pick exactly what you wear. You have to wear that no matter what you're doing or where you're going. You can't circumvent it by not going anywhere that day. You have to go and do whatever you're planning on doing. And that's once a week, you said? That is once a week a person at random is selected to wear pick your wardrobe. Obviously the wardrobe selection. Because over time it would become common knowledge that Andrew Yang uh, is subject to someone else's wardrobe choices and shows up to events in completely inappropriate and bizarre (laughs) outfits. Um, And it would be good for like a reasonable laugh Mm -hmm. and uh, like I'd have actually relatively modest issues with this because it might be kind of fun and funny. Whereas 13 piercings among two ears 
with rotation, I mean, that's ridiculous. <laughs> like you'd, you, first you'd look bizarre everywhere you go because you'd have seven different earrings and six different earrings in the other. And then if someone saw you on uh, subsequent days, they would think you were completely ridiculous because it's like you had to change every one of them. <laughs> like, uh, like you're, you're essentially making yourself into um, like a complete eccentric weirdo forever in most any setting. Um, whereas the second one can become just part of your fun persona. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I uh, think that that's right. And, and well argued. I think yeah. That's, yep. That's yep. Solid. I generally fall on the side of well, the one that requires less work. And so once a week, somebody picks what I wear. Um, if I can make one request, um, I, I like these kind of hats. And I've got a Yang Gang hat, but it's the dad hat. And I get it. Your, your crowd is a very dad hat kind of. But if I can make a request that, that you go with like the, the regular sort of new era-ish hat in the, the merch store, I would be, I'd be eternally grateful. I will send that to the team for you. <laughs> okay, all right. Wow. Thank you, man. Handshake deals, always political. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, there it was, an interview with Andrew Yang. He was great. Yeah, we got more presidential candidates coming. Uh, Michael Dukakis, if he's still alive. Will be coming uh, on the pod. I would love to have Michael Dukakis. I'd love to have Ross Perot. He'd be a fucking great guest. Um, uh, did, you, did you see... Uh, he didn't. Uh, uh, Pat Beverly was on JJ's pod. Oh, no. Come on. It was oh. good. Well, it was Pat good. Beverly's awesome. Yeah. JJ's. It was cool. It was cool to hear them, like, respect each other's games despite the fact that they're very different. Well, uh, and, and then Tommy having to jump in and say a couple things, of course. And, of course, you know, you heard Andrew talk about having JJ on his pod. We didn't push him on it. Like, that's not the right thing. I, we, like, look, we didn't speak truth to power in that sense. And that's no, all. no, it definitely didn't. Thank you to Andrew Yang, who was game and uh, really, really cool. And, and by the way, like came on the pod responding to a tweet. Like, so thank you to everyone who jumped in when I tweeted at him that wanted to be on. Uh, Andrew's pod is Yang Speaks. His, um, uh, his, his, uh, his uh, what's it called? His organization is Humanity Forward, uh, movehumanityforward.com. So thank I you. I thought something about him maybe running for mayor in New York. That'd be cool. Oh, that would be cool. De Blasio seems like a real, real turd. Seems like an idiot. He just seems like a, a moron. Yeah. Garcetti, too, over here in LA. Just not great. Yeah. Well, you know, well, that's a whole other thing. Nobody thinks about local elections. All we talk about is fucking president. You know? No, people, I think people are thinking about it more and more. Now. You realize. Now. Yeah. Yeah. I think people have been saying, like, vote, you know, organize locally and, and all that stuff. I think, yeah. But I think because of the Black Lives Matter movement, among other things, mm -hmm. like it's starting, and just the coronavirus and how, yeah. how many responses have been botched. Right. Um, just, it's, what a time to be alive, man. And mostly not in a good way. Wow. We got all this information, all this access to stuff, and it just mostly makes us sad and learns about new things to, to be mad about. I feel like we're gonna get there. I am, I'm positive, honestly. I get truly, there. They're there. I, like, I, I just think that, like, on, on a very, very basic level, even though I have problems with a lot of the world, I think all politicians are assholes. I think, like, social media is, like, the downfall of society. I believe more people are good than bad. I just do. And, like, I, I see, like, more people doing good things now than bad things, like, in totality. And I just think it'll win out, like, like by and large. It won't be perfect. It'll never be finished. There's Rebel. We haven't had him in years bark during the pod because we recorded on Sundays. I just think I think the good people will outweigh the bad. And I don't believe that will ever be finished. But I believe that the, the fight to be finished will continue and will progress. That's what I believe. I truly do. Long way to go. Long, always, but there will always be a long way to go because Absolutely. there's so much we don't know. But like, I do believe that the fight will will continue, and I am positive about it. So, because then otherwise, why are we fighting? If we, you know what I mean, like to a certain degree, like if we don't believe that it will get better, then I I, I feel like it is a, a waste of time. So I have to believe it will get better for me. That's what I agree with that. Yeah, I think it. There's better is better. Yeah, but there's you know. There's never done. We need, some, we need some fucking the fucking people that's are that beat John Lewis up are still fucking alive. Like those guys got to die. If you beat John Lewis on the Evan Pez Bridge, you deserve. You should be dead by now, please. That's my that's my parting thought. 
of natural causes. You, this is like the fourth time you've wished that somebody die. I, I, people were beating the shit out of people. That's they're white supremacist assholes. They deserve to be dead. And they're fucking in their nineties now, hanging on by a thread. Probably. Get out of here. We don't need them. God bless you. I love you. I love you to death. I love you. I do. Um, well, uh, we're gonna end the pod before you wish death on anybody else. I just want to be careful. That's this is just a, a security measure. Andrew Yang, sit tight while we wish death upon a few more people. Uh, all right. Are you done with TTP? Yeah, you know, like face. If you don't fuck with me, then I won't fuck with you. If you don't fuck with me, then I won't fuck with you. If you don't fuck with me. Then I, then I won't fuck with you. If you don't fuck with me. Then I won't fuck with you. But if you fuck with me. I'm gonna fucking kill you! Thanks for playing